WORTV, in cooperation with the Iowa State Extension Service, presents Down to Earth with Dave Bateman. Now, here's Dave. Well, good evening, and welcome to Down to Earth, and to our third in the series of 11 programs that we've planned for you on public affairs. Now you see tonight I'm seated with a group of good folks here from Story County and we intend to discuss this program after the show is over. In other words, we want to find out among ourselves just what we think and what others in the group think about this topic that we're going to discuss tonight. You know, it's methods of price or income support. We think it uh, has a lot of possibilities for a good discussion and we hope that you are in a discussion group or are making plans to be in one because there's a lot to be gained in this series of programs, we think. Now then, without further ado, we have to get into the program tonight, and I want to introduce the moderator for the series, Mr. Wallace Ogg, who is Extension Economist. Mr. Ogg? Thank you, Dave. Tonight we're going to talk about three methods of price and income support. Uh, these methods will uh, serve to help transfer income from the rest of the economy to farm families in a time of full employment such as we have now, or they be, and this would be called a high level of support, I think, or they can be used to, uh, uh, as a sort of standby protection in case a depression should develop. Now, the level, however, at which we try to support prices or income by any of these methods uh, does make a difference. If uh, it makes a difference in which of the methods or what combination of them that we might choose, and it also makes a difference about uh, uh, how difficult it will be to carry out the program. The higher the level, the more difficult it will be to uh, support either prices or income. Uh, one method that we can use is uh, the one that we're using right at the moment, direct price supports. Now, with this particular uh, kind of method, we uh, support prices. Uh, when the market prices uh, uh, when the market prices decline below the guaranteed support level, the gov government supports the prices by taking uh, part of the supply off the market and by storing it and disposing of it outside the market. This they uh, may do either with loans like corn loans or by government buying as we do with butter. With this method, part of what is produced is not sold to consumers in the market, but prices uh, still tell farmers that it's profitable to continue production and production controls then uh, usually will have to be used to hold down output and slow down or stop the piling up of surpluses. Now, this is the method used with 90% supports now and it could also be used with flexible supports. Another method is production payments. With this method as prices decline, the government makes, the different, makes up the difference between the guaranteed support level and the average market price by a cash payment. We used this method uh, on dairy products and on beef during World War II. With this method, what is produced is all sold to uh, consumers. Uh, the guaranteed price, however, does encourage farmers to continue producing just as price supports do and in this case, uh, production controls might be needed to hold down the uh, cost of the program. Another method that we might use is uh, the method that we call income payments. With this method, if market prices decline enough to cause the total farm income to fall below some determined minimum level, and this minimum level may be fairly high or fairly low, uh, the government would make a grant in aid to individual farm families, and, uh, and this uh, grant in aid would help maintain an income to uh, farmers. These payments would be made on, could be made on several different uh, bases. Uh, there could be several different means by which you decide how to distribute the payments. The nearest thing to this that we ever used was the old uh, uh, corn hog checks in the early 30s. 
Now, this method does not uh, uh, directly uh, interfere with prices. It lets consumers buy all that's produced, and prices uh, are permitted to tell farmers whether they're producing more than people want at favorable prices. Now, these then are the, uh, the methods that we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, we have with us uh, tonight our authority on the facts, as we have had in uh, uh, some of the previous programs, Mr. Carl Malone, my colleague. And then again tonight, we have uh, Don Fish, a farmer from Maynard, Iowa. Now, Don, in a year like 1953, which method or which combination of these methods would you choose? Being consistent with what I have said before, I think that in a period like 1953 that flexible support with the government supporting prices by either commodity loans or direct buying should take care of things pretty well. So in this kind of year, you'd, you'd choose the first method, direct uh, price support. That's right, Wallace. Uh, we have also with us tonight uh, Oscar <coughs> Lean, uh, a uh, farmer from Marcus. Uh, Oscar, in a year like 1953, uh, which of these methods or combination of these methods would you uh, prefer to use? I'd use all three of them. I'd use direct price supports at 90% of parity for storable products such as grains. I'd use production payments for other products uh, that even though they may be storable for a short period of time, would be of the perishable nature. Like uh, butter, say? <coughs> that's right and uh, might uh, be well to use it, for instance, in the proposal which the President made on well. There are reasons why it might be useful there. And I would use income payments uh, on acres taken out of production if they were taken completely out of production, if that was a necessary uh, procedure, and would be used for soil conservation purposes. And you would, you would uh, uh, like to use income payments to help achieve production control? Is that what you That's mean right. by that? Yes. All right, now, uh, we have with us tonight a, a new participant on our panel, uh, Lauren Soth from Des Moines. Lauren, in a year like 1953, uh, which of these methods or combination of them would you uh, prefer? Well, Ross, I agree with Oscar Helene that all three should be used uh, depending on the commodity, depending on the situation, depending on what you want to do. It's wrong to, uh, to make this an either-or proposition, either flexible supports or uh, higher price supports, either loans or uh, production payments. All these methods can be used and now should be. You haven't had a chance, uh, Lauren, to uh, uh, argue with either one of these men about levels, and each of them have expressed some preference about levels. Do you want to say anything about uh, uh, whether you'd be interested in a, in a support at 90% uh, of parity, as Oscar has indicated, or at a uh, more uh, with some flexibility as Don has or something different than that. Do you want to well, comment on that? Uh, here again, Wallace, uh, I'm not going to tie myself to 90% of parity or to 75% or any other figure. I think you have to look at each commodity and what the situation is and what you want to do. 90% uh, of parity doesn't mean the same thing in uh, cotton, for example, as it does in corn. I happen to think that 90% of parity is a pretty good support for corn and not far out of line with what we want to accomplish with the corn price support program. I think 90% of parity is ridiculously high for cotton or wheat. How about butter? 90% of parity is way too high for butter, too. And uh, when you've got a commodity piling up in storage the way butter is and the consumer is being forced to switch to oleomargarine, Obviously, butter is priced too high, and the support ought to come down. Uh, Don, I think you've indicated uh, before that you uh, uh, would uh, be inclined also to uh, uh, make some difference between commodities uh, in, in the flexibility. Do you want to uh, comment on this uh, before we go on? <coughs> That's one of the things that I've had on my notes after each one of these panels, is that the thing that was indicated was a commodity by... Uh, commodity approach because uh, uh, the ho as far as I'm concerned, uh, especially when you're tying yourself up to something like parity, uh, there's no one answer for any two things that will come out right. Well, uh, now 
Uh, Oscar, if I understand you right, you would be willing to have it commodity by commodity just so long as it don't go below 90% of parity. Is that right? <coughs> That's right. And uh, <laughs> the other thing is, you see, with production payments, you can maintain it and still find out about the level where the consumer will, uh, where he would buy a given product. And then you would be better able to determine the kind of production that was necessary for a given product. Uh, when you talk about 18 or 20 cent ole is against uh, 75 to 80 cent butter, um, it would seem that you would have to have much less than 75 percent of parity to get uh, butter consumed in sufficient amounts to take care of the production capacity of today. And you'll probably find that you're going to have to really get take cows out of uh, production uh, instead of just uh, butter. You're going to have to do some very drastic things, it seems to me, in the dairy business. Well, now let's, uh, <coughs> let's move on to this business of methods in a little different uh, uh, framework. A number of people have expressed concern, and particularly uh, among those uh, folks that I associate with, economists, that we may be in for, uh, well, anywhere from a slight <coughs> recession to a fairly uh, sizable uh, one that might even almost call, be called a depression. Now, as I remember, one Australian economist, Lauren, has indicated that uh, we might have somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, uh, seven, eight million people unemployed by the end of this year. Now, if we got into a, a recession, and supposing we did, I'm not predicting this, and I don't really think we will, but supposing we did have seven million people unemployed, uh, what, do you, what do you men think then would be the appropriate methods that we ought to use, or a combination of them again? Any of you? Well, if you're asking me, Wallace, uh, I should say that agriculture and all the rest of the economy should look to something besides specialized programs for this kind of an operation. Uh, in other words, you want a general approach to prime the pump for the whole economy. And uh, one way to illustrate what I mean is that as far as agriculture is concerned, the budget message that the President gave to Congress today is of far greater significance to uh, general economic stability than, and to the prosperity of farmers than anything that he proposed in a specialized farm program. What I'm saying is that if you do have a beginning of a slump, then the thing to do is to uh, operate on the economy as a whole through fiscal and monetary policy, and you can't do very much by a farm program or any other specialized program of that kind. Now, uh, I, uh, before we go on to talk about what you want specifically for methods under these circumstances, and I do want you to answer that question, uh, I think maybe uh, Oscar and Don might want to comment, however, at this point on uh, what you've just said about uh, general stable stability and full employment. I suspect we fairly well agree here. That's right. Uh, I feel that uh, if we would approach uh, a depression any way uh, nearer like the one we had in 1931 and 32, that uh, uh, anything that might help the whole economy, we should do, and I certainly uh, wouldn't disagree with that a bit. I can remember in 1934 and 35 how desperately we needed the corn hog checks we got, and uh, if that is a necessary part of the pump priming operation, as Lauren says, why, uh, I'm for it. Well, uh Oscar, did you want to comment uh, well, about this general yeah, just, stability just thing? Just one. Um, now, I understand we do have a program coming up on this later, so I don't want you to take <coughs> all the thunder away, but I think it would be a good idea for us to get some agreement here if we, if we have it. Well, I'm, I'm in general agreement. The only thing I'd want to add is that uh, we do have built into our economy now some things we didn't have at our last general depression, such as um, unemployment insurance and things of that kind, which will be helpful in those areas. And it might be that there is where we, at that time, is when we might want to uh, really explore the possibility of this income uh, payment thing uh, more than we have expressed it so far this evening. All right, now I want you to come to my question, and nobody's answered it yet uh, except in this general framework. Uh, if we had, uh, at the end of this year, seven million people unemployed, say, which of these methods or what combination of them would you, uh, gentlemen, like to use to uh, uh, really provide uh, support and uh, protection for agriculture? Do you want me to name you? You can start, Don, if you want to. Well, I would just go on uh, 
the way I, the way I started, that uh, I don't think s seven or eight million unemployed is, is a major a depression or recession or whatever you economists want to call it. And I still uh, see that nothing to indicate that the program, which I have uh, expressed myself as believing in, wouldn't be sufficient. As you would you would say that even under these conditions mm -hmm. that a, a program of uh, <coughs> flexible support using direct uh, price support would be that's the right. You see, the the reason that one of the reasons that I have liked uh, flexible price support is it gives us a floor. I, I don't know, but what perhaps I might prefer sixty percent to seventy uh, personally. But uh, that's the thing that you you get out of that it is a floor, and uh, sixty percent of parity on corn would still be around a dollar a bushel and. Uh, I think it would keep most of us relatively solvent. Do you fellas want to comment on his position before you state your own, or you can well, do as you like? I'd like to say this, uh, Wally, that first of all, in a depression or in a general downtrend in the business cycle, any agricultural program wants to be consistent with a general anti-depression policy. Now, any kind of price supports in the market, even Don Fish's flexible supports 75% of parity, are going to... Or 60%? Even 60, perhaps, I don't know, but you remember in the last depression that 50% of parity seemed pretty high. The point I'm making is that any kind of a price support that actually supports prices, that does something more than the market would do, aggravates the depression. It tends to make food harder to buy for city folks, and it tends to uh, hamper the general program of the government and of business to get us out of the slump and to get recovery started. Therefore, I think we shouldn't count on price supports, even flexible supports, for much help in a depression to agriculture. I think we'll have to turn to something else, and as Don Fish says, some kind of income payments to agriculture as part of a general pump priming operation. Maybe the old corn hog check idea, maybe uh, something tied to soil conservation. That has a general popular appeal. Pay, pay farmers extra money for building up uh, soil conservation structures on their farms and so on. A uh, lot of different ways that you could do this. One proposal made by an Illinois uh, professor was for income payments of a very direct kind tied right to the income tax. Take uh, the farmer's income tax and pay him a, a percentage on that basis in cash when you got into a real serious depression. Now, uh, all I'm really saying is that price supports in the market are not a good anti-depression uh, tool at all. And we have to look for something else in agriculture in a real depression. And the thing we want to look for first and I want to repeat this, is that depression starts outside agriculture and you've got to cure it outside agriculture. You've got to operate on the economy as a whole and let's not look upon price stabilization programs in agriculture as anti-depression machinery. I've talked too long, Wallace. Well, I think you've said some good things. Uh, Oscar, oh, you well look I like you'd like <coughs> to get in, though. Yeah, I sure would. I, you know, uh, Ordinarily, in the past, uh, we've uh, thought of agriculture as being the forerunner. And I'm not too sure about what is pretty much the forerunner of a depression today, if we should have one. And that's one reason why I want to maintain rather high supports and good income for farmers to keep them from going into the tailspin first. And uh, I'm pretty sure that they are a significant group, if they aren't the most important group in uh, our economy from the standpoint of uh, helping us to get into a depression. And so uh, uh, until we really get in there, until it is proven that we uh, get into, uh, or th that we have a depression, I'm gonna stick to the rather high income for agriculture. I think uh, Carl Malone, our uh, a man who's been very sound over here, would like to have a chance to uh, get into this at this point and uh, comment. Uh, uh, so uh, Carl, what, uh, what do you have to comment what these men have been saying? Well, I would like to see if I understand what they said, about, particularly about this prosperity period and what they're going to do then. Now, as I get it, Oscar Helene wants high price supports or 90% price supports and also production payments for the perishables 
And when he, he does that, he's thinking largely of the matter of supporting farmers' income and somewhat less of the matter of making adjustments in agriculture and somewhat less in the matter of our foreign market. Whereas Don Fish, who takes the other side and wants flexible supports so that they would slide down in the case of uh, larger supplies, is much more concerned with freedom in agriculture, with having farmers a chance to adjust and make changes and so on, and he's not as much bothered about the prospect of farm income being lower than they are satisfied with. And Warren, so I think, Warren, as I get your position, you're sort of in the middle ground. You want to keep agriculture fairly flexible. You don't want to put all your eggs in any one of these baskets as to methods. But you want to adjust things in total by pretty good planning so as to come out well. Now, all of you then departed from this when you got to depression, and you come much nearer agreement. Now, I wonder just how uh, near uh, this agreement is. I think you've, uh, you've made an excellent summary, uh, Kyle, of their positions uh, for a situation such as we have now. And uh, I'd like to see uh, whether we do agree and how far we do agree on this business of uh, uh, what we do for farmers in a, in a if a, um, say, a, a recession. Let's not call it a major depression. I don't think either, Don, that uh, uh, 7 million unemployed is a depression, but uh, let's say we have that many and call it a recession or whatever you want to. I think we ought to see now, uh, Don, it seems to me, has, has put himself on record as favoring still a flexible thing with, uh, with uh, uh, a floor. Wallace, there's, uh, you'll excuse me, there's one little thing that I've felt for the last two weeks uh, needed to be said, and that is that the things that I say, I I'm saying them because I am a, uh, an American citizen first and, and a farmer second. Uh, it just happens that I happen to feel that a, a free enterprise agriculture is very necessary to our well-being of our whole government. It, that's the reason I'm saying the things that I do. Some, I think, uh, if necessary, uh, having a little lower in incomes in agriculture is a price well worth paying for that. Uh, I uh, agree entirely with what Lauren says, and I feel that when you come to a depression, whenever you want to define it as such, the main cure has to be outside of agriculture. I figured 60 to 70 percent of low supports would interfere less with the other mechanics of getting us out of a depression than 90 percent of supports. That's, that's why I s well, that's true. said the things I did. Yeah. Now, uh, there's one thing that we've kind of left uh, hanging here, and uh, uh, Lauren has indicated that uh, any kind of price support is not a very good <coughs> method of combating uh, uh, a depression and helping incomes during a depression. And I think we've left Oscar in the position of supporting uh, uh, prices and, uh, and production payments and being willing to use income payments too. Now, what about this? Do you want to comment on his uh, criticism of price supports in this case? Well, <coughs> just one comment uh, in this short time that uh, it seems to me that we haven't said much about foreign markets, but if we are, don't have enough um, outlets, then the income payment seems to me ought to be made on the acres which we have to take out of uh, production. And uh, there, I think, is where the income payments ought to come into play. Um, the only thing about income payments that I'd like to add to that is that there's something we should never have to do. There's something we should keep in reserve, but a depression in a modern uh, society like ours should never get to the point where you have to resort to that. We have the know-how. Excuse me, Lauren, but if I were a farmer and got income payments, I would fe feel like I was being kept by the government. And Well, uh, I wouldn't. Uh, of course, <laughs> you're, I, a l you're a lot more afraid of uh, I don't think many would, be, would feel like that. Uh, after all, the tobacco farmer, you know, has been voting up as high as 99 percent for his control. He's doing it year after year. And uh, they aren't, uh, they're pretty good American citizens over there. I believe they're getting along all right. Sure, uh, everybody is willing to accept government handouts, uh, except Don Fish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're being a little hard on Don, and I think uh, Don really is interested in, uh, in uh, the welfare of the country, and he may disagree with some of you people about uh, how uh, we have it. Now, let's, let's just sort of uh, uh, see where we have gotten to in this discussion, and uh, then we'll... Uh, um, let the group over here uh, make some decisions about it after we we get through. But as, it, as we have 
uh, discuss this thing tonight. We have had the three methods of price and uh, or income support. There's the direct uh, support that we, we're using now. There's production payments where we make up the difference uh, between average prices and the market price with a cash payment. And then there's the income payment, which, uh, uh, as it's been described, doesn't usually relate to, March, uh, to market prices at all. Now, I think you, you can recognize that any one of these uh, sorts of methods of doing the job could use another method that we haven't talked much about tonight but have earlier, and that is uh, production control to boost by uh, reducing the supply, uh, the boost the total income for agriculture by, produ by uh, uh, lowering the supply and boosting prices. Now, these, uh, these methods uh, have been discussed both for a, for a, a period of good times like we have now and a period of depression. I think we want to point out that the most important thing is that there is a real difference in the kind of method you use for one time and another. Uh, Dave, uh, uh, will you take over with your group over there now and uh, go ahead? Well, Wallace, thank you very much and to your group over there for a fine discussion. Now then, what do you want? Do you want a fixed or you want flexible price supports? By the way, uh, if you uh, have any uh, questions you'd like to ask us here on this uh, program, why don't you write me here at WOI TV and we'll try to answer those questions for you. And by the way, we've been getting some mighty fine letters in here too, a lot of them in fact, both of them, lots of them rather, on both sides of the question. For instance, we have a, a couple of letters here now that I want to read to you briefly. Here's one from Earl of Iowa which says, we are back of Mr. Fish 100% on his ideas. It seems to us if the supports are lowered while we have such a surplus it would discourage the speculative suitcase farmer who is in it only because the government guarantees him a profit. Now then, on the other side, here is a group that met down in, uh, met in Clarion, Iowa rather, and uh, all seven couples signed this card saying, this group disagrees with Mr. Fish 100%. So, Mr. Helene, that should be some consolation to you. Now then, about next week's program, uh, Carl Malone, I've asked him to discuss it briefly with you because he has a lot of good information on it. Carl, would you take over here and discuss the program we intend to have for next Thursday? Uh, well, next week, we're going to have something a little different. Uh, we're going to move to the political process. Now, the way our society operates, it is the function of the political process and the political representatives to find some kind of a common denominator of our ideas and to stand for this common denominator or that that is in their judgment the common denominator and pass it into laws for the benefit of our people. And so next week we're going to have representatives of the political parties here to give their ideas of what this common denominator is regarding our farm program. That, I think, will be an interesting session. Well, thank you, uh, Carl, for that. Now then, have you tried or have you uh, started uh, a group discussion of your own or have you uh, become a member of a group discussion in your community or in your neighborhood? Why don't you go to your county extension director or your county extension home economist and find out if such a group operating and, and get to be a member of it so that you can also discuss, as we intend to discuss tonight after this show is over, uh, some of the problems that were brought out here. I, uh, I think you'll enjoy it, and I think that the County Extension uh, Office will have a lot of good information for you. So until next Thursday night, then, good night. <laughs> This program was produced for the Agricultural Extension Service of Iowa State College by Dave Bateman. Technical director was Vern Castor. Down to Earth was directed by Jake Dunlop. <laughs>